And so a lot of us, <laughs> a lot of us, we when we see those programs, we kill them. Oh, I don't know this program, I'm gonna kill it. Yeah. And what happens? <laughs> and, and, yeah, and the suppression major- <laughs> reaction, exactly. Yeah. And and majority of those processes, when you kill them, they come back. That we feel like the person who's going through this has control over it. They don't. Those yeah. programs just take over. That's the that's a big problem we have. And so one of the one of the best tools people can build to fight against fear and achieve their dreams, whatever they want to, is learn how to adopt mindsets, build mm. identities, and and we let go of our fears. And then what happens? <laughs> Today's great guest. He's a leadership coach, executive coach, and has a long standing career in the software engineering area. Join me in welcoming Taha. Welcome Hello. back to you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for coming on today. I'm really looking forward to this topic today. Taha is here to share with you really interesting insights in an essential skill that any person, but especially leaders have to actually master, which is to master and manage an emotion that we all know it's called fear or anxiety. And you're going to let us know or let all of us know uh, an interesting perspective, how we can tackle this fear to make it to our advantage. And I just, before we dive in, want to underline this because in today's world of uncertainty and all things falling over the place and change every minute, this is essential and thank you again for coming on today and doing this because i think we're not we're going to learn a lot from you my pleasure my pleasure thank you alex for that warm introduction hi everyone i'm taha Hussain. i'm a leadership coach uh, like alex mentioned i i love doing engineering stuff so let's dive into fear we all know fear about you know what fear is for the longest time i actually was unaware of fear to be really really straightforward like beginning like I was one of those people who would speak up in meetings, would talk around without thinking about the consequences. Like what is right is right. And when people would not make sense in, you know, unintelligent situations where people are not making sense, you're talking to them, but something else is taking over them. I would not understand fear. Like they Mm. are talking about, uh, they're being unintelligent. You know, I would look at it that way. Ah, right, the lens, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then then one, one day, um, I stopped making sense to people. And I was going through a very difficult time in my life. I was going through a divorce. And mm. what happened, I started figuring out my own emotions. And I became scared of life because all of those things that are in my life about my children, about me, about my future, I just suddenly became fearful and I didn't know how to tackle fear. Wow. Uh, and my at work, people who were like, my, I had a new boss. I remember he gave me a feedback. He said, you know, I can't make up my mind about you. Sometimes I think you're brilliant. And sometimes I just see average. Ah. Like what's going on over here? So those things gave me an indicator. Something's weird going on because these two things are mixing together. Something's really, really odd happening over here. And so I started, you know, embracing my emotions first. I would not embrace emotions. I started embracing emotions and fear was one of the biggest factors. Wow. Uh, so, so here's what I learned. Being a software engineer, I'll give you one example how to look at fear. And the fear we're not talking about over here is when there's a line that shows up. Hmm. When there's a line shows up, I don't know what to do. You right. probably Google it, figure it out, run or whatever you want to do. But I don't know about that one. I want to talk about that one where you want to speak up in a meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see something's happening in you know at, at work. Someone is not treating somebody correctly and you want to stand up to say something about it. How oh, do you right. build that up kind the of situation that we all know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you go about and do that? And so yeah. we're going to talk about that. There's also a part about us where we want to do things, but we are so afraid that our mind does not even tell us that, hey, you should be doing these things. We are unaware of them. So yeah. ah, the unconscious one as well. Let me just underline yes. it's sometimes it's even not conscious. And as you said in your personal experience, we have to first of all maybe go through a process of making them conscious, right? That that's because right. We don't maybe even conscious. realize that we're scared of something. We we don't even know what's causing this this yeah. problem, right? And so so the analogy I'm gonna give you is, is in, in computer, we have something called task manager where you see all your 
applications running. So when your system, yeah. you know, becomes slow and all, we open up this task manager and we start looking at it. Oh, I see the analogy. Oh my God. Yeah. Carry on. So now, so now you see that, right? Like there's yeah. so many pr things running, but yeah. you get surprised. Where are these things? I don't even see them because yeah. you only see like a few things. Run like right now you'll see Zoom running probably and nothing else. But if you open up task manager, I can tell you there's probably 50 things running over there. Absolutely. And, I love this analogy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so what happens that those processes is running Mm -hmm. They are taking our resources, our CPU cycles, our memory, our attention. They're taking away yeah. our attention. So, so if we are afraid in a situation, those processes, they take over. It's like a trigger. Something happens, it will trigger. Um, and they will start taking your attention span from the actual thing you want to do towards yes. something. And to the others... You will feel like I see sparks of brilliance sometimes. I don't see it mm -hmm. sometimes because your processing keeps going. Things start stealing your resources. And so a lot of us, <laughs> a lot of us, we when we see those programs, we kill them. Oh, I don't know this program. I'm going to kill it. Ah. And what happens? <laughs> and, and, yeah, and that's a question <laughs> reaction. Exactly. Yeah. And, and majority of those processes, when you kill them, they come back. They are <laughs> like you there kill them, anyway. They come back. They come back. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they keep on coming back. And so what I found out was it's, first of all, not everybody knows as a task manager. Hmm. Not everybody knows how to open it. That's a nice Not analogy, everybody yeah. knows how to go in and take care of those processes, okay? So yes. one thing I found out, those processes basically come into our life, hmm. in our brain, without us even knowing. You know, we'll have yeah. someone we trust, like, right? for example, growing up. Our parents, our environment, our teachers, everyone has their own biases and limiting beliefs. They have their own fears, what hmm. they've seen in life. And they'll warn you about them. And you'll say, okay, yeah. I'm taking all these notes. And the thing is that they're giving us, all, conditioning us with all of their fears. And we take yes. them over. Right? And for me, it was the same case. Growing up in a culture where divorce is seen as end of life and kind of thing for your family. Catastrophe, was, yeah. Yeah. I was stigmatized. All of those hmm. Exactly, right? But if you know that you are about to go in a situation where things are like this before you go in mm -hmm. you can better prepare yourself so that's one thing i found out how to how to be in, situ in the situation but not let those uh programs make it into your task manager and, and you know start taking resources so that's one part um so may I just jump in yeah. there in your experience that you just shared with us? Thank you. Like, how did you then go about this where you received that feedback? I mean, obviously, in that experience, it was not apparent to you that there might be some emotion or yeah. what did you do? You know, for the for the first two years, I completely denied emotions, even mm. in that situation. I used, I was blaming everybody else around me. I just mm. became a blamer. Um, I would not take feedback well. I would not take, you know, and I was just agitated. And this is what happens that we feel like the person who's going through this has control over it. They don't. Those yeah. programs just take over. That's the that's a big problem we have. And we think about PTSD as people coming from wars and stuff, but these things are all PTSD because they take pro these programs, they keep on, they just take over. And mm. so so my journey was first of all admitting that emotions exist fear exists and i'm afraid and it it's coming in different ways so i found it too when i started becoming aware about it i found two ways one is it gets stored into body it's somewhere mm -hmm. in your body it's it's ah, there yes. as a pain you, can actually start to feel it physically yes. yeah you can feel it in physically I, I got these aches and pains here and there um then the other part was uh when you're aware about certain behaviors that you do, uh, when you become afraid, like you push back feedback mm. or you, you, you're you talking to somebody and they're talking about something and you are, you're afraid where it's going. You want to finish the conversation. You want to, you, know, you want to run away from the conversation. So, you know, freezing, you know, running away from, from things because you're being afraid of that. Mm. So, but you know, it's a very, it's in the beginning, it's slow for me. Yeah. It was a slow, it, it took time. And what really made it better was meditation. I started ah, meditating. And thank you what happened in, in, in meditation, I, I started realizing that I have I have thoughts, and then there are there's there are things I'm thinking about. Like mm. I'm thinking right now as to how to formulate my response for this conversation. Those are not thoughts, 
but thoughts are something i'm just sitting and things which just randomly hit me hey what's my son doing today that's a thought because ah, i'm yeah. i'm thinking about him subconsciously a program is worried about my son for example and so i would write that down and find now through meditation and through awareness the more awareness i have um i can record later on in my self reflection as to how my day went and where in those areas i was reacting because of fear and those those responses were not okay unfortunately it's very hard to figure out when you're going through that in the moment when you're in the moment of mm. fear you're not listening and it's only after the fact when we're out of the emotion you know fear the problem with fear is we have made fear a bad boy but it's not it's true we actually culture i mean many cultural cultures do associate with fear a negative emotion and that's yes. actually a very interesting part you're saying because it's actually not negative it can help it us is not it. it is not negative and here's the problem fear is our buddy it saves us right but the problem is because and that's a problem because it's our buddy it saves us it also comes in situations where it should not and it it hinders us and so mm. now we have this odd relationship i want to trust this i do trust it but then it does these things to me and when trust comes over because of our buddy tr- fear wins all the time if it if it overtakes you you cannot go against head to head with fear you know it's yes. like if you if you uh, if you watch i am a harry potter fan fear is like dementors they're going to show up and once they show up you know you are in that moment so you have to be prepared before you go in to yeah, deal to, with the fear to deal right? with it and, and accept it yeah exactly and so the way i solve my insecurities and my fears once i identify them so i'll tell you the the ways that i tried first i used to do it number mm-hmm. one hit the gym oh ah, very gym, good exercise feel like so yes. exercise and the pain all of that it comes out and your body feels really good the dopamine hits you're feeling really good and this is what tells us that going to the gym makes you feel good the problem is once that effect goes away fear comes back because you haven't really killed this is the killing part you just go and kill uh the process running and it just comes keeps on it's coming back there. it makes yeah, you, the it's still there because mm. you haven't addressed it the other one was I, which i used to do is ignore it it doesn't exist yeah and that usually leads it. to nothing because we have Not- to accept it's there yeah <laughs> yes and this but is we, a, yeah. what you're saying now is crucial because the self awareness that is so hard it's really hard i really agree with you because to accept it and see it that it's there that's the first step really yeah and i'll tell you the third one which is the most common um ignored one that we mm-hmm. do but we are not solving it it's meditation it's okay. really odd in meditation we so i use meditation to see how to open up my task manager and see what fears are there so i can examine my thoughts mm-hmm. and i can build my connection with my brain so calm calm myself down so i can get out of fear anxiety and now i'm in a better position to handle my fear yes. a lot of people feel good, majority of the people feel good over here and then they move on they don't do they don't ah, they don't address the okay issues. you you saying a different thing you saying it's just a way first of all to get connected with yourself and then yes. the work starts right then 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 the yeah. work starts people leave because mm. they feel good afterwards and so th- so what happens the, the the fear comes back anxiety it's comes not, back exactly it's, it's not, not addressed yeah. yeah yeah anxiety is an alarm system just like you had an alarm system so that it just <laughs> pops up in our in our body to tell us something's not right over here and we see that hey you know it's just warning me not to speak up so it's wrong over here and i'm just going to speak up the thing is that sure go ahead do that it's a short term solution you really have to fix a long term yeah. this process should not be running at all because i have experienced it i didn't have these processes running and i was like amazed Right mm. now, but here's what happened. I'm so lucky it happened for me because I got to learn about my emotions. I got connected. So when I, when I started learning how to deal with fear, this was the real leadership part. The first one was actually fake. You're not dealing with emotions. A mm. leader deals with emotions. A yeah. leader knows how to work with your with yourself and other people so they can lead each other. So maybe an interesting question now for the viewers would be. some other examples what are for you some typical examples where a leader should be prepared or at least be aware that fear is normal because what i really like about this conversation as well is the message is fear is a normal human emotion it shouldn't be it should not be a taboo right it's something yeah. normal and we should just learn as a human being but especially as a leader to 
accepted. And so could you name some other examples of situations where it's just normal that fear is there as a leader? Sure. Um, I'll give, I'll talk about my example. Well, one, one fear is uh, everyone has to go through places where they have to challenge the status, like whatever is happening, I'm going to change that. So if you are an engineering manager or you have a team and you have work to do, you're going to keep on doing the work the way it's happening. And that's our habit because we are all comfortable with that. Everyone uh, is yes. doing it. The main thing is that now you have to change situations. This thing is not good. And so mm -hmm. we wait for somebody else to come and tell us, hey, change this. And then we change something. But as a leader, there's no need to wait for anybody to come. You got to keep on thinking proactively. What changes should I bring into my team? But mm. if you are afraid of change, which is the case with everyone, then ah, you are going nice, to nice change. Example. You're not going to yeah. do that part, right? Number one, actually. That. That's number one. I mean, it happens all the time because human as humans, we're not wired to to like to change we don't like yes. we, we like to be convenient and carry on as like uh, i don't know 20 years ago so the number one fear i would agree with that is always fear of change why should yes, i change that's right. yes yeah. excellent that, that's example. true yeah and so 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 one thing i that has worked for me well is to always maintain an, an identity mm -hmm. and so it's one way to block fear in getting in wherever you're going, but still act as a leader and not run away situations is to uh, constantly maintain your own persona, who you are, what your values are, how do you behave in certain situations. Hmm. And while those questions are there, they are driven by a certain persona that one has in, you know, in our mind. Uh, for example, if you, if you think about someone famous, say Nelson Mandela, and if somebody has re researched Nelson Mandela really well and they say, okay, how would Nelson Mandela behave in this situation? You can tell exactly. This is what Nelson Mandela would do. He would mm -hmm. start, he will talk about it, right? So having that identity really helps us mm. in, in becoming the ideal version of ourselves. No, so when a change needs to happen, the change is happening not because somebody is forcing on us, because our identity resonates with that. We say, hey, yeah. this thing change because I am not sitting comfortable in this because your body automatically says that hey it gives you anxiety if you are mm. not changing towards the right identity hmm. so actually what you're saying also is that the identity is something that that guides you and makes it easier to actually always adapt right because you have that, right. that core within you that okay if now I don't know whatever is next after AI will change Yes, I'm changing now to AI, but I will change even to the next one because my core identity will stay the same. You That's made right. a better example. <laughs> no, AI. it's a good. So I'll give you. I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll give you one of the persons that I I'm a fan of. This guy, his name is Arnold, the the bodybuilder, right? The the, the ah, movie yes. star, right? Yeah, and he Austrian was in, in yeah. Austrian one, right? And so he talks about it a lot. You know, Arnold used to in when he was in America, he used to go to college. He used to hit the gym four to five hours every day for Mr. Ah, yes. Olympia competition. Mm -hmm. He used to work on his accent reduction classes. Like he used to do a lot of stuff every day and sleep for six hours. Oh, and yeah. this, and, and so the way Arnold describes that is other bodybuilders would look at the weights and they would have this painful feeling on their face that I have to lift these weights and my body's going to hurt. But Arnold would look at them as one step closer to my dreams. Yeah. And he would he would he would he would enjoy the process of doing that and then what happened that arnold once had to act in a movie 1975 he was mm -hmm. his first breakthrough and the mm -hmm. director said you have to be at 210 pounds or less wow and arnold was at 245 pounds and this is pure muscle and oh, to burn right. the muscle he has to run and he hated running he didn't want to run his body would not be about all running so he knew that he has to install the mindset the mm -hmm. identity of a runner first because uh -huh. he has to run eight to ten miles nice a day example. yeah and he knew exactly because if you a lot of people push themselves hey let's go out the bed and let's hit the gym you can do that one day you can do it two days and you should start doing that sometimes you have to push yourself in the beginning you cannot do it for more than two two three days you know you yeah. are punishing yourself 
But that's nice because changing to the identity of a runner is completely different. It actually changes your mindset first. And then yeah. you start to say, okay, so I'm a runner now. So now I like running. So it makes a complete, yeah. you completely reprogram how you think about now, it. Running, eating, recovery, stretches, ah, yes. everything is different. The whole everything is different. Yeah. Everything is changes. And a lot of them are in conflict with the bodybuilder mentality. They say, don't yeah. run too much. You're going to burn your muscle. Now that's and where so it gets interesting. Yeah. And yeah, so mm. there's conflict. So he knows how to change that. And so one of the, one of the best tools people can build to fight against fear and achieve their dreams, whatever they want to, is learn how to adopt mindsets, build mm. identities. And, and we let go of our fears. And then what happens, staying in your situation makes you fear that you are not in that mindset. The whole mm. idea is that if you know what you value and those things are not happening, then you then your anxiety starts that you need to move ah, yes, and do course. something. Nice. That's where anxiety. Yeah. That's where the anxiety comes in and tell you you had goals. Remember, you want to do something. How about you go and do this now? Mm. Right? And 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 then a lot of people will figure out. Oh, but I still don't want to do it. Then you start pushing yourself, starting from mind mind identity, and then you get into this whole motion about it. So so um, for it's me. <laughs> Uh, you asked for the example. Let me give you an example about it. When I was at Microsoft, my um, I had five bosses at Microsoft in three years. Mm -hmm. uh, the division that I was part of was a, a new division in cloud computing. And our goal mm -hmm. was we didn't have our own work. There were other teams across in Azure called cloud computing. And our job was to go and help them improve their services. So it's mm -hmm. their service. But we are going in to help them improve the services. And the biggest problem was uh, everybody in the team would sort of assume that, hey, the other teams are pushing back. They don't want us to come and help them. Mm -hmm. And so the mindset was that, hey, you know, they feel like we are eating their food. Like we are doing ah. their work and they don't feel like they're not welcoming us. And Microsoft was very specific about this behavior they knew this behavior would come in so mm -hmm. when i was hired in hr gave me uh, gave us training on orientation i was surprised by that they had a slide uh it started off saying <laughs> a slide of columns what we value and those values ah. were all tied to hero-based culture and i was like my goodness this is all hero-based culture they don't like to appreciate teamwork and it was like glorified ah, and, then okay. they, mm -hmm. and then they opened up the next column and it was all about teamwork and they said okay. we we used to value hero work we realize it doesn't work for us so this is what we value now but people over here in microsoft has been here for 20 plus years uh, and they're was... used to hero based work so yeah. when you come in you will see them struggling you are so here that to was help actually them. what you were supposed to tackle right that that shift yes of that mindset, shift, that shift mindset. of thinking in the but probably not that straightforward after 20 years for these people yes, right yes yes so yeah. microsoft was reminding us that Hey, you're coming in, which in the culture, we know you already had this culture at Yahoo and like Google and other places, but we want you to empathize with the people over here. They're going through this change. You are part to of the help journey. Them in that transition. Help them go to the position. Mm. So, so when I saw that happening, I was also, by the way, easily caught into these fights where that conflicts where yeah. teams are thinking, Hey, you're coming with your reasons. Doesn't help me and stuff. But then eventually the, what, what worked for us was well, for my team and my peers and others is to think from their perspective as to what change they are going through and help them make it safe for them. Like, I'm not stealing your credit. Here, I'm going to put your name everywhere where we are going. I'm going to run things past you. Basically, create us, change uh, the yeah, way you the, work because yeah. the work is different, right? So we were basically you addressing in, their yeah. fears. Yeah, you were helping exactly. them voice it, right? Yes. But what happened was Microsoft did a very good trick. Microsoft prepared me for my own fears first. They huh. told me that you're going to go, you're going to see something weird happening. Nobody is fighting for you. Nobody is against you. It's mm -hmm. just that people are agitated because we are helping them going through change. Oh, that's so, nice because otherwise you don't feel safe. Yeah. Yes. Otherwise I would say, hey, I'm going to yeah. draw my boundaries over here. These people don't work well for me. And I saw yeah. that happening exactly. People who ignored that orientation or that mm -hmm. message, I saw that happening. That people uh, yeah. were thinking, hey, nobody is helpful over here. Or people are like, they talk on each other's face, uh, you know, kind of stuff. So that's nice as a briefing, actually. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah. I worked Preparing also in, in similar yeah. roles, actually, being a catalyst for change. And it can be hard because if you don't listen to that at the beginning, that actually it's normal that people will resist. You can fall prey yeah. to that. Oh, my yeah. God, I'm the only one in the corner. Nobody is listening to me. It can be very hard. So it's it good. Like, 
you they made you first feel safe before you went there to help the others to feel safe yeah that's but right yeah that's wow that's passionate that's really but it's a good example as well so fear of change and then also as a leader uh, what I experienced in my experience of working with teams and leading teams was also this fear of uh, being or how do I phrase this fear of being supposed to be the one who knows, even though we all know a leader is not the one who's supposed to know everything. But like in my first leadership experience, I was always kind of having this, oh, my God, am I supposed to be the one who knows everything? No, but it took me a while to realize that actually it doesn't mean just because I lead a team that I'm supposed to have all the answers, right? So that was my fear to learn that actually, no, it's I'm going to coach the others and they're going to find the solution. It's not me. You see what I you mean? You are right. Yeah, no, you are right. And I think that's where imposter syndrome kicks in. We start yeah. feeling like, you know, exactly. I need to I need to have all the answers because if I don't, then I, you know, I'm not qualified for this job and then I'm going to lose my exactly. job and people are yeah. going to know, right? And so, so that's true. Now, here's what's happening. On my journey, I was sort of able to cross over this bar. Uh, actually, I crossed over this bar in the... I know how it felt like before I went through my divorce and all. So I knew exactly how to speak up, you know. Like, for example, there's a... Cadence is a very simple word, but for some reason, I never heard this word. I had mm -hmm. never heard this word. And it came Sorry, up in a meeting. Word? Sorry, which word you were saying? Cadence. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of, the, one of the managers used it. And he was talking about, hey, we have to maintain the cadence of the work and, you know, kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And so he kept saying that. And I was like, excuse me. And then there are like 50 people sitting. And I said, what's cadence? And mm -hmm. this guy looked at me as if like, like, you don't, like, he gave me this look. And I'm like, and I'm like, are you going to say it or should I Google it? Right. Because yeah. we can just make this fast. I, I see that kind of look you're giving me, but I'm, I'm completely cool with this. Right. So you have to live with that. I failed over here to communicate with the person as to, you know, exactly like I wasn't able to, to hold my own fears over there. So what he's thinking of me, but I was still like open towards that. Years later, when I knew how people are thinking and imposter syndrome, I was more aware I was coaching leaders. Uh, one of my bosses actually told me once, because I asked a question at a meeting, and he said, hey, I, I, I see you ask things you don't know in like meetings. I said, yes, mm. if you do that, then you will lose respect of people because they think you don't know stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, he's projecting his fears on me. Yeah, how do that's I, a good how do way of him? seeing it because, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How do I help him? And he's my manager as well. And so at that moment, that person was already in, in the fear mode. So I'm giving one tip over here. When somebody's acting like that and you know that's not right, don't stand up at the moment because you're going mm. against fear. Fear will that's, always win. That's so powerful what you're just saying now because this would be a situation that you could read completely different. It's a, a situation that happens 100 times in everyone's working life every day. And it actually means being aware of the other's emotions as well. What might the other person be going through? through yeah. at that situation that is so powerful yeah and you know a lot of times we think about people are screaming at us or they're blaming us and we think about, about hmm, so them. we are the problem it's actually yeah. about them they exactly. are facing something and they're unable to you know go through that anger is not an easy emotion it takes hmm. effort to have anger right and they're going through that the thing is that that program in their head ran they don't know about the task manager you can't point them about it. And so there are different ways how you can help others. But one, number one thing is that with yourself, others, when you are in that moment, don't go against fear. Yeah. In that moment, it, it is good to, first of all, not do anything and <laughs> to calm down. Like calming down sometimes means also to say to the other person something that relaxes them, right? Exactly. Or something yeah. completely different to, to, to make them feel, hey, I'm not your enemy. I'm, I'm, we're cool. And then maybe yeah. to ask them, I don't know what your experience is, but for me, what worked was also to ask them, hey, uh, after the meeting, do you want to talk about it in a different time and invite yeah, them? Yeah. And then yeah. also once they're safe and they feel okay, maybe to talk about it, right? And to give feedback. Yeah. Well, awareness is key. You need to know what you are after. Mm. Like you, you, you learn that, yeah, I'm getting triggered for this reason. I'm getting triggered over here. So the most um, important thing to understand is we think that our rational mind understands logic. That's why I, you know, the, the old me used to think about 
emotions are bad because there's no logic in them. And logic is very easy, one and zero. For me, computer, computer guy, one and zero, yes and no, very simple. We prefer things like that. You know, that's how our biases also work. Make it simple for me. But the real world <laughs> is in shades of gray. There is no one and zero. There's a, it's a spectrum of things happening, right? People just don't love you or hate you. There are things they exactly. like about there's you. There's lots they don't of like things in between, you. yeah. And <laughs> yeah. we would, um, agree also that uh, there's something about the human condition. We were conditioned to that. I think it's also this belief in science that we believe that we can project the one and zero logic onto human beings, but it doesn't work. It doesn't you know, work. This, it doesn't work. We, we are actually... Pro- we work in a different logic as human beings and it doesn't work the zero one logic. We work in a very different way. And the reason it doesn't work in zero and one way, I'll give you an example of this uh, research psychologist. His name is uh, Jonathan Haidt. He wrote a book mm-hmm. called The Happiness Hypothesis. Okay. It's one of I'm, my f- I'm going to Google books. that one for sure. An amazing book. Uh, uh, Heath Brothers wrote a book on that book. It's called Switch. And at Microsoft, when I was dealing with change with people, sometimes I would get like, like sometimes people would get on my nerves. I would go to my boss to air out. And one day he said, I got a book for you. And he gave ah. me this book called Switch Change. He said, Excellent. this will help you. <laughs> and that book really helped me. And it was a perfect gift for me. Um, so this Jonathan Haidt guy, he gives an, an analogy about it. He says, I was once in Arizona at a retreat. And that retreat had, you know, horseback riding. And so I was doing that. They taught me how to turn the horse and move the horse, drop the horse and stuff. Um, and then I was on my own with the horse. So the horse and I was strolling around. And then suddenly the horse started walking, you know, going towards a cliff. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to go near the cliff. So I started moving the horse. The horse won't move. It would just kept going. And so I started like kicking the horse. It nice kept one. Going. <laughs> Nothing else. And then the horse came slowly towards the end and I was like panicking and right before the cliff, the horse stopped like five feet before that. It took me about 30 seconds to catch my breath and, you know, stop blaming the horse and cussing the horse. And then I started looking around. It was so beautiful. It Mm. was a majestic view and it could only be viewed on a horseback at that distance from that cliff. You see, the horse was actually trained to bring him there. He realized that the horse was trained. And many tourists sit on the horse and they kick the horse because they're scared. But the ah. horse has been trained to ignore these things and walk all the way towards the cliff and let them view. So he sat there for 10 minutes and then he moved the horse. The horse started walking again. So this yeah. is what he described. He says the one of the best ways to think about how our mind works is that we have two minds. One is an emotional mind that is represented by the horse. Mm -hmm. And we have a rational mind that's represented by the rider. We are so used to driving cars. If the car doesn't move in the right direction, we think the car is going to go up and it will. But horses don't work that way. If you have a bad rider, the horse won't jump. Horse knows safety, right? And so our mind works this way. What happens is that emotional mind is concerned for fear, Hmm. not the rational mind. The rational mind needs to guide. So when the rational mind starts thinking about fear, like future anxiety and stuff like it uh sometimes your uh emotional mind would just turn it off it would say hey you know what i don't want to hear you yeah and well, that's you're, what you're, you described can... before right when you had that analogy with the uh with the task manager that yeah. sometimes we need to just acknowledge first of all that it's there and that will help us already by not fighting it for god's sake Sorry. exactly yes <laughs> you know no, no. because we're so yeah. stubborn in our in our belief in science and rationality that's what i find about myself as well that we always think oh we can over dominate it but it doesn't work yeah. anyway we're human beings yeah. So better just acknowledge it and accept it. And for me, going back to my example, as soon as I had accepted it, that I had this fear of having to know everything, even though it was not real, then it made me overcome it because I realized it's not even real. It's not even there. You know, we also identify the ghosts in the room. They are ghosts. We just make them up. (laughs) We do do it a lot. And but but again, the problem is that it's our friend. So what happens is that uh, the program won't go away. The only way we can talk to the program is you know surprisingly our emotional mind even though it's not the rational part of the mind it requires data you just yeah. cannot say things are fine you have to give it data it you have to make it believe so when we are oh, thinking about yeah. our, 
our mind saying, hey, don't worry about it. It's just in your head. Your mind is saying, okay, so you're telling me I can speak up. Yeah, go ahead, speak up. But I saw five people getting fired who spoke up <laughs> in my previous job. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, but this different guy. Sure, but I haven't seen how he works. Right? So your mind still requires data. You just can't fool it. Right? Mm. So I found out you can't have data all the time. So there is a different type of data it looks for. And that data, Tony Robbins talks about it a lot. I love how Tony Robbins talks about it. It's the tonality. So if some, you know, he gives an example, says, hey, you know, somebody has a gun. It's, hey, I'm going to shoot you. Nobody's going to believe you. But if you take the gun out and put on the head and say, I'm going to shoot you, you know what? You're going to believe that guy. Because tonality, physicality, all of that matters, right? And yeah. so he says, when you tell yourself that you can do stuff or you, it's okay to do this, you have to really believe in it. You yeah. have to tell yourself, like, you you know what you mean, what you're talking about. Oh, I think I should do it. No, you, with that attitude, you're never doing it. <laughs> exactly. Right? So, yeah. It really so matters you need to, how you it really, talk to yourself. Yeah. How do you talk to yourself about a certain mm -hmm. topic? So a lot of folks would do stuff and they would not do it. And then what happens eventually? You know, what happens when somebody keeps making promises, but they don't keep the promises? Yeah. You start trusting them, right? Exactly. So one way to do that is to start building uh, trust with yourself. If you say, I'm going to hit the gym, your body's going to say, I'm going to press the snooze button. You know why? Because it doesn't really believe you're going to, you you want to be that person who wants That's to hit it. the gym. So you know what? You push yourself out and you go to the gym. You're telling your body that I really mean it and I know it's going to hurt you because you don't want to do this. You're not excited about it. Next but day, same really, thing. This is the work actually. That's what you're now describing. This is the actual work we have to do with ourselves. And I'm smiling, but I know how hard it is. This is the hard part of it, right? This is the hard yes. part to really, first of all, work with yourself and convince yourself. And yes, I'm going to do it. And sometimes also some experiences help. From my experience, it's like when you do it once and twice, you start to trust yourself. And yes. you start to say, okay, yes, I can do it. Okay, so carry on, for God's sake. Yes. And so you need to kind of really work on yourself first. And then you start to get going kind of thing. Yes. So... So you you're giving yourself a boost, mm -hmm. and then you and then you you you, you pick it up, and yeah. so we can do the same thing with others as well. When we recognize others are having fear of taking a step, we can first of all first listen to them as to what their fears are, yeah. then communicate to them in the same tonality and stuff as to why you be. I'll give an example. I had I had one of my long time the very first team that I had, uh, one engineer. Um, didn't know a certain piece of technology that we wanted mm -hmm. to work on. So it, and it was new. And when I talked about uh, him learning that technology, uh, he showed, you know, a lot of fears. Oh, I don't know how to do it. And like, mm -hmm. I'm comfortable in my zone. He was also the senior most person in the team. So I realized yeah. that he also had some fears that he was talking about as to how others might see him. Like ah, okay, failing. because he didn't like, identify with that technology, perhaps. Yes. And if he, Possibly if any, any identity. <laughs> Exactly. And when he does it, he might and he will fail and others will see it. So he had that fear as well. But he wasn't aware about that fear. Mm -hmm. I asked him certain questions. I realized that. So I started, give, I gave him a, a learning plan. But the way I talked to him about, I first of all established myself as an expert in that technology at that ah. stage. Because I was a new manager. I, I was really technical at that stage. And so I also had to step back from doing things on my own and coaching my team to learn and do stuff on their own. So this was a, a very easy step for me to pitch, step in and say, you know what, I'll do it myself because I'm a champ in this already. But I already knew I, I'm not supposed to do that. So I started mentoring this person, but I first established myself as the expert in the area that I, mm -hmm. if if he follows my process, he will become the best engineer in this. I also oh, gave him nice. hope about the work I had seen he had done as to the work he has done that is required uh for this work to learn and nobody in the team understands the work he does so he is going to oh, bring in a very nice. unique perspective to the team so what happened was he started seeing a new identity my goodness right now i feel like i don't i i'm not important the team but if i do this i become I really be important, important. Yeah. i add a lot of contribution and i will earn my own respect i will learn new things over here and so it took one or two exercises for him to do it and then boom like he was and done. you got him there that's great but this is nice because you worked on this was exclusive identity work right that you did yes with him yes. and he was probably really grateful that you gave him that little nudge in that direction right 
I mean, he, literally, he's, took you many meetings, but <laughs> yeah, he he still talks about it. Yeah, I can imagine. But this is a good example because what you were actually talking about the meeting was not the technology. You were talking about uh, respect in the team, his identity, and what he can gain from it as himself as a leader, right? That's right. And so and so uh, going towards the other aspect now, so how do you think about fear and take care of your mm. fears? And, you know, like if you were to do it, if somebody wants to do these things themselves. How do so uh, maybe now to round up. So thank you so much for all these insights to round up. What advice would you give to aspiring leaders or those who are just starting their career in terms of how can I deal with a self-doubt or how can I build more confidence because we talked before about the self-awareness. How can I, what can I start with? You know, there might be some viewers now, maybe in their 20s who just start their career, who ask themselves, okay, what do I start with? What do I work on first? There were so many tips, but give me one tip to start with. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, one tip to start with. Well, it's hard. That one tip is nested. <laughs> so <laughs> we start with identity, you know, or think about identity you want. That's your future yeah. vision. We all have goals, right? I want to achieve that. I want to achieve that. Your identity is a goal. You're walking towards that. The moment you start thinking you're a billionaire, you know what? You're going to start walking towards your billionaire dream. Yeah. It, to people who are not making much money, it sounds like, ah, but that's exactly true. If you think your home is that way, you're going to walk towards your home that way. True. Yeah, I agree right? with that. So, so write down your identity, what you want to be. Examples, um, Sasha Fierce. Sasha Fierce is a character designed by uh, Beyonce. Beyonce used Who to be Sasha a very shy girl. Sorry, I don't know this character. So, do you know Beyonce? Yes. So, Beyonce released an album called Sasha Fierce in 2008. Oh, okay. And she came on Oprah and she talked about it. And Oprah asked, you know, who is Sasha Fierce? And she says, that's me on stage. I am shy on going on stage. But wow. I need to perform on stage. So when I put my shoes on, that's a trigger for me that I turn into Sasha Fierce. And she is not me. She's ah, the one who is not shy. Is not shy. So that identity, and then she kept on doing it and she just became that person. And there are that many examples good. like that. You put your goal like that and you go towards that. Executive coaches, I, I coach people on identity, how to create their own identity. And I charge a lot of money for that. This is where Sasha Fierce is also born through some other uh, leadership coach who helped build it. Yeah. So build your own identity, start looking into how do you do that part. Now, identity is so important. You know, when we give people feedback, we say, you know, don't shame people. Don't say you are stupid or, you know, yeah. you are lazy. Don't like label people. Yeah. Label the behavior. What you did, this is wrong. Yeah. So I thought a lot about that because I have given so many feedbacks. Whether you do it this way or that way, it doesn't work. People mm. keep thinking about what to do. You know what does work? Is to going back to the first statement. If I label you as a person, you are stupid. What is that? That's identity. Mm -hmm. Identity works. Yeah. So make it work. So I saw, you know, when I was in... And so when you learn these things, you go back in your life and you start thinking, why did these things work? When I was in elementary school, I was once, uh, I didn't study for my test and I was uh, copying from my next neighbor and he also didn't know. I was, And this was a math test. And suddenly I noticed my teacher was in front of me. So I looked at the teacher and he looked at me like this and I was like, and I was ashamed and the teacher said, you're cheating? I thought you were a math genius. Ah, identity again. That and, <laughs> yeah, she, he said, I thought you were, I thought you were a mad genius. Mm. He said, you know what? Do it. I'm, I, 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 I don't feel good right now to deal with this. You go ahead, whatever you want to. I felt so bad. I took yeah. my paper, gave it to him right away. And I took the next test and I just became a very good student, not just in yeah. math. Because everything they else. projected you as a math genius. That's the identity. Was, Brilliant exactly. example. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, shame on you, you're cheating. I'm going to like, what would that do? Right. And we yeah. do that all the time. Right. Because so that's, 
I sorry to jump in there, but it's like yeah. very useful because the identity thing always works when we use it to the positive identity. That's exactly. Say because people always when important. they do blame games, they usually go into the negative identity. Exactly. That is a downward spiral, and what you just described was it completely created this upward spiral, pulling yourself exactly. out or into a math genius identity. Exactly. And so so in, in yeah. intelligence as a teacher. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So. <laughs> I, I tell this, you know, not everybody knows how to coach people, how to teach, you know, it's a very yeah, different way of thinking about it. But everybody coaching. can learn that. It's not like you can't learn it. And yeah. once you learn that, you can apply the same things on yourself and ah, learn those things, nice one, and, yeah. you know, get into those spaces. Um, so how to build this identity, there's a framework for it. And mm -hmm. people don't realize this. That is the book I've read seven plus times. It's called... Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Oh, thank you. That's my all-time favorite. That is yes. since the age of 17. All-time favorite. The, <laughs> the, the, the problem with that book is, you know, the first three times I read that book, I was thinking different. Mm -hmm. And oh, then yes, it, you it was... It totally. Oh, God, yeah. You read when it you apply, when, yeah. yeah, when you keep on applying it, applying it, and you... Because it's a difficult book, and he has so much wisdom in that... You know, and he, I think the seven habits, he had to name it seven habits because of the hook probably, but it's really identity creation. It's he the seven identities, you, yes. Yeah, so so the first three habits tell you that if you want to build an identity, you need to start thinking from the end in mind. Hmm. And in, in your first thing, first section is you are doing private, you're doing stuff in private hmm. because doing in public, you're not ready for it yet. You have to learn things about yourself, how to manage your own self. And he says, you need to be proactive first. You need to stop focusing on things you can't control, like influence. So you remain focused on identity. So he creates an identity for you. And he keeps on telling you, stay focused on the identity, stay focused on the identity yeah. through by being proactive, put by prioritization, put first things first. Now, that's, once you master that, the second stage is go in public. So in yeah. public, now you're working with people. So he says, think win-win. Right, yes. and this and is where you are. Then it's for the relationship building. Then it's with the exactly. other. Exactly. It's a so fantastic, you... a fantastic. May I just uh, yeah. say uh -huh. that Go it's ahead. a fantastic way of looking at this book again because I have, I'm actually completely injected with that book. I live it. It's a philosophy. I live by it. But yeah. what you're just saying is so brilliant because it's it's identity. It's not habits at all. Yeah. It's not habits, and those. So the second part is about going in public, and he talks about going in public. You have to think win-win. If you don't think win-win, what what are you doing? You know, at Microsoft, same thing. You know, if you're not thinking win-win, others will think you are here to take your own victory and they're gonna lose. Nothing you're here will to work. negotiate. Nothing will work, right? Yeah. So same. So second part is about building in public. So I would highly recommend people to understand, think about how to understand the this book about seven habits of highly effective people. I would start join with the you first in that recommendation. Habits. It helps so much. First three habits. I'm thinking about writing a, a social media post about it to to, to dissect that book and oh, go deep great. into it. Oh, great. Yes, because it's so it's really a great book and you can read it many times and you always find something new. That's what I like about <laughs> these classic yeah. books. Thank you so much for that. And uh, maybe as a also final thing, you're very active on LinkedIn. So I will, I will uh, uh, have the readers discovered your LinkedIn. And especially I want to recommend you recently did that video on behavioral interviewing. So if any of you of, you, of the viewers have an interview coming up, watch that video on behavioral interviews by Taha. It is excellent. And of course, I will also link in your coaching and your leadership, executive leadership coaching um, yeah. recommendations because I think you add a lot of value. Thank you so much for this brilliant. Thank you so much.